are on Revelation 5-4, and we talked about it a little bit last week, and um, let's read it. It may be too close because I can't even see it. Okay, I got it. Okay. So, um, let's read the verse. We read it last week. It says, um, then one of the elders said to me, now who are the elders? They're around the throne. And they're not seem to be so Sarah. Probably Sarah. Because they're Sarah. Arab elders, they're seem to be oh. humans. <coughs> Some people do, but I, I disagree with that because the original context of elders I is actually senators that, and, and, the, and the mayor of Athens. All the context... Um, some of the things fall apart, and we talked about that. Like they have crowns of gold. There's no crowns of gold given to Christians or humans anywhere. Um, and these are um, other than kings of cities and countries. They have those, but not in a, an eternal sense. Uh, also, these crowns are called Stephanos crowns, not diadem crowns. So they mean that they've actually earned them through something and something. Then your choice would be angels. angels? Yeah, seraph angels. Okay. And, and also, if, if they were the ones that we would think about, you would think that John would recognize himself in the future, right? Because John is the probably the highest of all the apostles, with the exception of of Paul. He would certainly be in that twenty-four higher group, but he's not, and he doesn't recognize anybody else that he should. Do angels, would those angels, can they possess a crown? Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. They have all kinds of, in fact, they have the unicorn of glory and of wisdom and all the other things. Okay. Take a little bit. So, yeah, my, 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 if you take all the context and you put it together, there are many people who divide pretty closely on that, but they all take it from the, the word presbyteros, which is the word for elder in the Greek, that has to do with the elders that are only specifically picked for the church age and for the um, and for the beginning of the church. So that's that's that, that's their only little root. And the problem is that it isn't. You look at all the rest of the context and it doesn't fit it. So that's why I would go with other people like um, uh, who, who believe that they're they're seraphs. Um, kind of kind of like the uh, the, the, uh, the general staff in, a, in an army, you know, which is the people who are. Um, they're, they're the advisors. If you look at the, even even the army today and the German army, many armies they have a general staff, and that is like the highest level of generals mm -hmm. for strategy, and they are the ones who actually give information to the four-star, five-star general. So it says, uh, "Do not weep. See, the lion of the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals." So notice there that it says, do not weep. Um, we're in the wrong one. Huh? I'm reading the second one. Yeah, I'm on four. Let's go back to four. So it's already been five, right? Hopefully we'll get to four because it's kind of the answer to the question. He said, I wept and wept because no one was found at, uh, was worthy to open the scroll uh, and look inside. Now to me, to me what's what really fascinating um, uh, about this is, um, oh, one second. What's fascinating about this is that it gives us a whole new um, viewpoint of worthy. You know, that, that's one thing that, that jumps out of me in, in the verse is um, worthy. Worthy is a is something that we throw around pretty easily, but the scripture here is saying that there. If you remember the verse before we looked at, there's nobody above the earth, there's nobody uh, on the earth, there's nobody under the earth, and in all of heaven who is worthy to open up the doomsday book. And what that tells us is that um, this worthiness that, that is required to open this is beyond uh, anything that we have the ability to evaluate. And it'll come out, obviously, who that is. But focus on, focus on what it takes to be worthy to open this. You know, it, it also kind of gives us a little hint towards the future of the the judgment that has been given to Jesus Christ, it gives us that part too. That makes sense. So that's the part we want to look at. Is that it gives us an assessment of worthy. Most of us don't look at worthy as being a big criteria because most of the time we look at worthy, we're doing it relative to other human beings. 
-hmm. And that's kind of a real low standard. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, because if you look at the angels, and they're up here, and what it says here is that there's no, not even angels, not even angels. There's no angel um, who has been around for eternity. Not Michael, not Gabriel. They're, none of them are worthy to open that book. And to me, that, that, that really raises the, um, the standard to what most of us would look at as being worthy. What does it take to be worthy to open this book, or even to look inside of it? Because we remember that. <coughs> so the weapon wet part is the part I wanted to get to, because uh, I actually want to spend time talking about this. It's not often, uh, even though it's not the focus of it. <laughs> Things hide when you get older, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, the part I want to get is, this, the part that I want to get to is that he weapon up. So let's kind of go through the verse, and then we'll come back to some of these verses we have up here, to evaluate um, emotions and to evaluate weeping. <clears throat> so um, the, the pieces that are here, he says, I weapon wept, and it's an, it's an emotional response. And emotion comes in good and bad, okay? But it's not often that we see somebody of John's caliber lose it. Okay, and that's really what he's done here. He, he, he's weapon weapon. What it says here is he says um, he, he, he's mourned and he's mourned deeply. Okay, so what it tells us is that what's happened here is that he, John has actually become disoriented for a moment. His emotions have allowed him to open it. And for us, the, the problem is that we don't have enough, I think, we the church itself generally does not have enough doctrine to understand why he's so upset. Okay? Um, what happens is that a lot of times when we talk about, we, we just drive right over verses and we actually don't think about them. And in reality, these are a quick thing. Whatever it is, the, the person who is the highest spiritual person, both by position and maturity in the world at the time he writes this, which is 96 AD, whatever it is about that, this man, John the Apostle, the last of the Apostles, if all the rest of them are dead, this man is grieved to his bone that nobody's going to open that book in the vision. And why is that book important? Because nothing moves on without it. We're stuck here. Did God not give him that peace? When he... he did. He did. That's really important. The truth is that John knows his Bible doctrine. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that uh, and this is a really common thing, so I'm telling you that because it's important for you to know when it happens to you what it is. And, and so much of doctrine is not for what you need today, it's for what you need in the future. God is bringing you here, and you are obeying that, and you are learning Bible doctrine, so that something in your future that God needs you to deal with, you will be equipped to deal with it. Okay? And this is where John is at. John knows this doctrine. You know this doctrine, right? Who is worthy? Jesus, Jesus. Jesus Christ, yeah. It, this is like ABC stuff, right? Well, it's not really ABC stuff. You actually have to know who, you have to have a feel for what Christ, uh, what makes him worthy. But in reality, what's happening at this point, BD, Bible doctrine, at this point, this is blocked from him. And the reason it's blocked from him is because he's become emotional. And what, what emotional does, when you become emotional, what happens is that you lose your doctrinal orientation. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. There's two viewpoints, okay? One is divine, okay, and the other one is human. One of the good things and bad things about us is that we're human beings, okay? It's one of our flaws. But if you know you have the flaw, you, you're not upset when you see it. You just redirect yourself, okay? Uh, this is divine viewpoint, and with the, what is a, what is divine viewpoint? It's God's thinking. Yeah, yeah it's God's thinking. Yeah. It's, it's, it's divine viewpoint. It's, in reality, it's Bible doctrine. If you want to know how God thinks, know the principles in here, you know exactly what he thinks. You find that in Romans 12 too, right? <coughs> Do not conform any longer to the path of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. How do you do that? Bible doctrine. You go to maturity. You put. You store it more. You're, you're kind of like a the proverbial squirrel. You know, you're just mm -hmm. gathering these little things up, 
the Bible doctrine of for when you need it in the future. Now, you'll need it in your you'll need it in your everyday life. But most of us, what happens is we know what our value system is, so we actually apply those things. We know, okay, I really want to lie because I want this, but God says no, so I'm not going to. And, and what is that? That's the fight between these two. Okay? Old sin nature. So you have this battle going on regularly. And what happens is when you come to church, you learn, you learn Bible doctrine, you, you stay in contact and fellowship with God, you're almost always picking this one. You're picking God's view, God's view, God's view. And what happens is when you stop going to church, you stop, you start going to this view. Okay? And this is when people come, when people go from here to here, people sit there and, and say, well, I have to be at church. All my friends are at church. This is where I learn about who God is. That's why I'm here. But you miss some of those. What happens is you say, well, there's a football game on today. It's really good. I could record it, but I'd really like to watch it live. And is, that, that's perfect, is that perfectly reasonable? <clears throat> sure it is. But is it perfectly divine? Absolutely not. So you're always, there's always going back and forth. And that's where he's at. What he is at is he is allowed. This is what happens when you have a sudden death of somebody. Okay, somebody dies. Somebody, you lose your job. Your wife leaves you. Your husband leaves you. You crash your car. You know, whatever it is. Your, your kids have problems. You know, they're going to get divorced. Whatever happens. What happens is that your emotion makes you forget. Okay, this is one of the, this is one of the good things about remembering verses. If if you know me very well, I'm not a per, I probably know I don't know 150, couple hundred verses. Um, but to me, I'm not a person who believes in memorizing verses because uh, although I know a lot of them. I don't memorize it because the doctrine is more important, more important, and most people can't pull doctrine out of verses. That's one of the problems with it. But what happens, it is a great parachute. So what happens is that whenever you find yourself being overwhelmed by something, you can go to like to Deuteronomy 31.8. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. That's a great orienting verse. You say it over and over again, and all of a sudden you, you breathe in again. Your head is going, ah, got it. What does that remind me? It reminds me of the doctrine that's over here, that God is omniscient, and he has always knew I was going to be here. This, this did not surprise God. I'm supposed to be here. What am I supposed to do next? See, that's what happens. But when you get paralyzed by emotion, you're disoriented. You don't know what you're doing. Okay, does that make sense? So a lot of times, if you find somebody with this huge amount of doctrine, who because of this issue is so big to him, and it's a big issue. It, the issue is that if the doomsday book is not open, all the stuff that happens in the future does not happen. Okay? An example would be, you think the world's a mess now. Let's, 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 let's take it on for another thousand years. I mean, none of us hope that happens, you know, because you think things are bad. I mean, it's, it's just... How long, oh Lord, how long? Mm -hmm. Right? So, so, we, so we get this, and that's where he's at. Except for him, he's in the vision. He understands what that book is for. He understands what it means. And he's looking at it and saying, oh my gosh, what if nobody's, wor nobody's worthy? Oh no, we're in what do we do? Yeah. So that's where he's at. And so he's, he's messed up right here. Now what happens sometimes <clears throat> is that you can work yourself through it on a verse. That's the best way to do it. Or you're kind of putting an anchor down. Okay? And what happens as soon as you, what happens is, is when you are emotional, guess what you're not doing? No thinking. Uh, you know, I say this all the time, but emotions has no mentality. It means it doesn't have any brains. This is why people kill themselves, kill others, jealousy, all the weird stuff happens when you're too emotional. You do things that in your right mind you would not do. Okay? And so, reality is that emotions has zero thinking. It doesn't weigh things. It, it somehow thinks that you can shoot the person that you love and kill them, and somehow that's going to satisfy the problem. Okay? And what happens is, or you can, uh, you can, you do this sometimes maybe when you're driving. You drive like a mad person, like a crazy person, because you're just, you're just mad, not realizing that you could cut them off, somebody off and kill them as a result of that. There's no mentalities. That's why, that's why in, in the Bible it tells us Christians are self-controlled. It's our requirement to self-control ourselves. Okay? So that's where he's at right there. And he isn't thinking. So the next thing that happens, well, the next verse we know what happens, is an angel kind of gives him a helmet slap. 
<laughs> hey, stupid, shut up. Stop whining. Yeah, that's what he does. And, uh, and that's a good thing. So I wanted to, um, let's go through the rest of this thing. It says, um, um, no one, no one, angel or man, because we went through the different places, right? We went through the three places that he checked, which is everywhere, essentially in the universe. And no one was found who was worthy to break open the book or even to look into it. Remember, it says blepo. Blepo means, blepo is a blip. It means to glance. They, no, nobody can even... Then we can even pry the little crack open, you know, because this book is wrapped with seven seals that God has put on. And those seals are still on today. Okay? And even when we do get to see into it, we do not get to see into <coughs> it as it is written here only from an outline point of view. In reality, um, most of us, if we could read the details of this, would be so horrified, we probably would be uh, stuck. You know, we'd probably be stuck too. Because the, the amount of death and destruction, if you can think about all the worst things that have ever happened and grew up them all together and just scoop them in to three and a half years, the middle of the, back to the part of the tribulation, and have them multiplied times ten and all happen in three and a half years, that gives you a clue of what the tribulation is. So we're not going to see, what we're going to really see is parts that are kind of descriptors of it. No pieces of it, but but there is nothing until that book is actually uh, opened and those judgments are actually unsealed. No one will know what they say. Okay, we, we get some idea, but we don't get it all. Um, if you have a King's name or a New King's name, you might have a piece in there that says um, they can't um, open it, look inside, or read it. That's not in the original context in, of the of the translation. So you can put a Scratch line for it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just sometimes that that, that, uh, that happened because uh, the uh, King James is based on about seven manuscripts. Uh, it's called Texas Receptus, mm -hmm. and that was all that was available at that time. Since that time, since 1611, which is when the King James was written, since that time they've discovered thousands of manuscripts after that was written. So that's why. That's why the difference. So let's go to our first one. Uh, number 14. What I, what I want to do is I want to look at, since we're at a time where we can take a quick look at the appropriateness of weeping. Because what I found out is that most believers know principles, but they, don't, they can't sift through them. Okay? So like we did a couple weeks ago where we went through the doctrines of rebel, uh, resurrection, that was pretty nice because it told you what you're going to look like in the resurrection, what the promises of God are. Are you just going to have a different body? No, you're going to have a body that can that is just like Jesus Christ. It's going to be invincible. You're never going to get sick. You're going to be about 33 years old. Mm -hmm. so, nice. Um, which is you know, my whole, how old he was. So you'll have all these little plus I'm, I'm looking forward to that. No more joint pains when you just wake up and you didn't do anything. Okay, so that's a cool thing. Yeah. Let's go to Numbers 14, and, and, and we'll just kind of talk through this. Most of you are familiar with this. Let's read the first uh, four verses. Um, and this is the setting. This is one year after the, uh, this is the Exodus, okay? The Exodus people. This is the Exodus generation of Jews, and they're at year one, okay? And they've gone into the Promised Land. As you remember, they took one from each of the tribes, sent them all out, and said, okay, I want you to go out and scope this out and see what you find, okay? So the, I'm giving you the whole, uh, and, and the place is Kadesh Barnea. It's, a, it's one of the more pivotal places. They go to Kadesh Barnea twice, okay? Just to let you know, there's one in year one, and there's one in year 39, that they do it. There's two events, but we're just going to look at one of them. He says, That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, um, If only we had died in Egypt or in the desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken like plunder. Uh, wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Now, it doesn't take you long to get into that verse and say, well, these guys are morons, okay? Uh, first of all, they're grumbling against uh, uh, Moses and Aaron. Uh, and, then the, and then they're saying, why is the Lord trying to kill us? Wouldn't it be better for us just not to... You know, this is the whiny pot side. So this tells us very clearly that this weeping that they're doing here is, um, 
is absolutely wrong. Emotional. Okay? Emotional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, it's not just one person emotional. This is like two million people. Emotional. Okay? <laughs> That's really bad. Yeah. So you can imagine they're they're just whining and crying the entire time. You, you know, it, it's. It, it, uh, I imagine that Joshua and Caleb and Moses are all saying, Lord, just kill us right now so we don't have to listen to the rest of this, this stuff. So we know who they are by what they've said. Now, on verse uh, 6 through 9, we're going to hear uh, Caleb and Joshua. So um, where is that? Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jeunath, um, who were among those who had explored, tore their clothes. They wretch them. Okay, the trouble. This is what happens when somebody dies or something's grieving. That's what the Jewish do. You'll see it, and they, they yank their clothes and tear it. It's like uh, somebody who's died. So you'll see it all the time. That's one of the means that they're in grieving. Okay, like somebody's died. And said to the entire Israelite assembly, uh, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord uh, is pleased with us, he will lead us to the, into that land. A land flowing with milk and honey. That means it's a very prosperous. This would be like going down the Central Valley of, 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 uh, of California and just seeing crops on all of them and then whining about it. Okay? So that's where they're at. Uh, and give it to us. Okay? Um, he says, um, only, only do not rebel against the Lord. So this tells us right here is that they are rebelling against what, an opportunity that the Lord has given to them. Okay? That's what that is. Again. Again, yeah. Um, and do not, do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Uh, their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. You remember some of the descriptions? They are like, they are like giants, and we are like grasshoppers. Remember all the descriptions they gave? Okay. So this is the other side saying, hey, you know something? They're big, but they'll fall harder. You know. Mm -hmm. So you look at Joshua and Caleb. They are just okay. You know something? The Lord is going to let us just kick their butt. This is going to be fun. Let's go for it. Mm -hmm. And then you have the other side of the other ten, the other ten out of the twelve, and they're going. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> so it gives you a good comparison. So you can see that the weeping here that you're seeing is absolutely unreasonable. Okay. Um, and what should happen, the problem is that they've been slaves. During that slavery, they did not learn Bible doctrine. They kind of abandoned their faith. And, and you know that because you know what happens. They can be complacent. Yeah, they, yeah they, what happens is that they're stuck in this viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Okay? There, there's two places you can be. Either the Holy Spirit controls your soul. Okay? This is for us as Christians. This is what happens when we're in fellowship. The Holy Spirit controls our soul. But when it's not... When we're out of fellowship, the old sin nature is what it controls your soul. Okay? That's why all the evil comes. But we know the answer to this because on 22 and 23, um, you're going to see how serious this offense is. Okay? Um, on 22 and 23, he says, um, he says um, this is the Lord speaking. He starts in verse 20. He says, I have forgiven them. We're over this. He says, but as a consequence of their behavior, he says, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who have disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. Not one, of, not one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Okay. And you still gave them ten times. Well, they, they'd seen all the plagues. <coughs> they'd seen the, the crossing of the Red Sea. They had seen him providing them the water. They had seen, you know, they'd seen all these things. Well, they, they'd seen these miraculous things that God has done over and over and over again. <coughs> In reality, the plagues took, took about one year. And then after that next year, they traveled around. And there was another year. So they've watched the Lord deliver them in miraculous ways. Yet as soon as something happens, they throw them out. So what, what the Lord's saying is that those people who saw this, those men, and this would be the women too, <clears throat> because they're, they're anybody who's 20 years and older, so it tells us what the age of accountability is for your decisions. Anybody who's tw 20 years and older will not enter the promised land. There's only two that enter that promised land. That's Caleb, uh, Caleb and, and Joshua. But all these, which there's like 600,000, they were all dying in the desert. And they had wives. <laughs> and they had, let's say they had two children. Yeah, mm -hmm. These have a shot at it. These 
will all die in the desert. Mm -hmm. They will never meet that promise. God's plan was for them to enter the, the promised land in year one. Mm -hmm. They obviously wandered in the desert for 40 years. 40 years. Okay, and God miraculously takes care of them. So it gives you the answer to the question. In reality, they are way off base. Okay. So let's go to the next one. You wonder um, why they're chosen. Mm -hmm. You wonder why they're chosen. Chosen is opportunity. Okay. In reality, one of the things that's really tough about Christianity today, in my mind, is that everybody has the truth of God. Most of the people don't live by that truth. It's kind of like... Um, um, it's kind of like giving you the greatest gift and then having you squander the gift. It, it is God's desire that every believer be absolutely unequivocally happy every single day. Now people will, will tell you that's not true, but that's not true because God, it is God's desire that you have his happiness. And that happiness comes from contentment. You see, that, does that mean you're going to be like jumping all over the place? Well, no, that just means that you're crazy. Joy, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. But does it mean that you have a contentment? You have a direction mm -hmm. that you're going into all the time? Yeah, that's what God has in mind for you. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says that when He says, uh, uh, "My yoke is easy, my burden is light." Yeah. Okay. So all this stuff you hear about all the really, really bad things, in reality, they're not true. The Lord tells us right now. It says, "Come to me, come to me." My, 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 my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And that's because you live a life that is powered by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So you have that. Kind of, that's the piece that's in, in Philippians where it says, you have the peace that passes all understanding. Okay? Everybody's looking around saying, everything's horrible in the world, why are you so happy? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. That's what they should be saying. But you can see a lot of times that Christians don't, Christians don't understand happiness of God. That's one of the problems. So they think they have to be happy. So they're going, hey, yeah, I'm so happy, happy, happy. It's like, okay, you're an idiot. Stay away from me. <laughs> and that's probably the unbeliever that's saying that. So in reality, God offers that. But it's not because you're powerful or that you're smart or anything like that. It's because you lean on God. Jesus is your strength. The Holy Spirit is the power. The, the, the Word of God is the direction. It is the truth. Okay, so it just has those things. So let's go to uh, Philippians 3.18. And you will get an idea of some of this piece here. Uh, let me see. And this is part of what, we, what we're seeing here. For, this is the subject of emotion. Um, for, um, for as often as I have told you before, and now say again, even with tears, okay? This is Paul. This means Paul weeps over this, okay? So many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. He's not talking about unbelievers. He's talking about believers, okay? The enemies of the cross are not the unbelievers. They are the believers in this context. That's why he weeps. Does, does he weep over the, over the unbelievers? No, he doesn't. He weeps over the family of God. That's his burden. And it says here, their destiny is destruction. What it means is that they're not losing their salvation. It means they live a horrible life. They die the sin to death. Why? Because they live like idiots. Okay? It says, their God is their stomach. Now, it's, it's not that they eat a lot. <laughs> it, what happens is whenever you see something talking about the stomach or the kidneys, um, it's talking about your emotions. Because people, even though you, where, where, anybody, where is your emotions actually? Right there. Where do you feel them? Right here. So every time you see about it, you say, oh, my heart bleeds. Well, this, your heart just is a pump, like you have in the swimming pool. Nothing else. When, when, you, when your heart is actually, your heart's here. Yeah, and your emotions are here. They're all right there. They're all in the gray matter. It's actually, they're, they're in the soul. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's, like, I, that's how you take care of problems, right? <laughs> so when I talk about it, he says, what he's saying is, says, their God is their emotions. That's these people. That's the people we're talking about, like the Israelites. They are driven by their emotions. And people do this in Christianity, you know, uh, and I'm going to make some fun. You know, they go, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, And they speak in tongues, and, you know, you know how I feel about that stuff. It's pretty obvious. <laughs> but, you know something? They, that, that is a person who is, they're not spiritual, they're emotional. Mm -hmm. How do you know that, okay? God's prudent. You never see God acting weird, do you? He never, he never screams and does weird stuff. He never acts uncontrolled. God is absolutely controlled, has always been controlled, and will be controlled in both directions of infinity forever. 
because that's who he is. He is, he is the stability of all things. So, guess what we're supposed to be like? S stable. Okay, we're not supposed to act weird. God, if you act imprudent, you may be acting in your own emotions, but you are not acting according to God. God's not weird. God's, God's not dissonant. He, he doesn't play heavy metal music and call it Jesus whatever. You know. He doesn't do that stuff. You, you look at the word of God and you see who he is. You know who he is. If, if God acted weird to you, you'd be scared. Okay. So the whole point of that is that when you see people acting weird, it doesn't mean that they're crazy. It means that they're emotional. They're off target. They're, they're, this is their God. And today, more than ever, emotion has become the God of Christianity. That's people says, oh, we need to do another retreat. I need to go up into the mountains and be with the Lord. So you're supposed to be right here with the Lord. Okay? Right here, every day. When you're changing diapers and you're washing dishes. That's when you're with the Lord. When you're working at your job, no matter what that job is, that's when the Lord's with you. Not up in the mountains. If He's, if he's not with you here, He's not with you there. Okay? Because there's only, He's with us every moment that we, that we invite Him into our life. Okay? And I don't mean that in the salvation sense. I mean that in the fellowship sense. Is that what happens is we get disoriented, get reoriented. Just confess that sin. And move over. When you see yourself acting weird, recognize what it is. Why do we act weird? It's because we're human beings. You know, we're squirrels. We're, just, just we're ask, weird. You know. We're you, just... Do you believe like in when they have men's mountaintop gatherings or women's retreats and things like that? They're all emotional, or they're unnecessary. Hmm. I'm gonna get in trouble here. <laughs> Let's turn that tape off. Um, <laughs> I, I would well, say that. About 90% of all the men's retreat, I've never been to a woman's retreat, I was. Um, not about 90% of all the ones I've ever been to are absolute hooey. Mm -hmm. and, and because it's like, you know, so it's not about weeping. To, I mean, if, if God does that with you, it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's you personally, and it should be in privacy. Mm -hmm. Because we are priests of God, mm -hmm. and priests of God guarantees privacy. That's why it says, it says when you pray, where do you go? We don't have prayer closets. It means to be private, to go and spend that time. And then if you weep or you have that, that's you and God. That's not for other people to see. That's a privacy of the priesthood issue. So okay. what does that one look like? The, the one, per, like 90%. What would, what would that one look like? Would be, if, if it actually, it's going to sound horrible. Okay. I'm just going to say it because I get in trouble anyway. Yeah. It would be just like we have in this class right now. Okay? It'd be sharing in worship. It'd be sharing in knowledge. It would have the Holy Spirit teaching you because that's why you're here. You don't come here. I mean, you may come here for fellowship, but that's not God's. God's desire is that the church is designed for your teaching, period. That's what it's for. Yeah, that's why you come here. It's, it's not for ice cream. And as much as ice cream is fun, the pop less is fun, and it's fun to hang out and, and love each other, that's not its purpose. The purpose of the church is to have the teacher or the pastor teach you Bible doctrine because that's what you lack. That's, that's what it is. But how about the word revival? Yeah, that's a hooey word. <laughs> now you're getting in trouble. Yeah, it's a hooey word. Okay, so, so wh why do you need a revival? Okay, in reality, uh, if you're talking about an evangelistic revival, yeah. evangelism actually does not take place inside the church. E evangelists should not be in churches. Mm -hmm. yeah. They should be I'll outside. Be because guess who's in churches? <laughs> believers. Mm -hmm. Guess what evangelists have to do with believers? Nothing to do. Okay? Uh, it's nice to hear their stories, what they did. Yeah, hey, here's five bucks, you know, whatever. But in reality... They are supposed to be outside. When you evangelize, you don't evangelize here. You evangelize out there. Okay? The evangelist has no job here. Pastor has a job. That makes sense. Yeah, but he, so revivals actually don't belong in churches. And you're not supposed to bring all your friends. You're supposed to bring all your unbelieving friends. Mm. But there are also those coming to church that is not, that is not believers. If a believer happens to come to church, that's a good thing. And the Holy Spirit will speak to that person. Many times what you find, what I think is very interesting, is why, the, and you've seen it with, even with Joe. While Joe is teaching his sermon to us, feeding the sheep, the unbeliever comes in and the Holy Spirit speaks to them. What do they speak to them? Not about what's going on here. Because the, we know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
in reality, First Corinthians chapter 2 tells us that the spiritual food, the talking that God does with us, unbelievers cannot understand at all. Zero. They have no ability. They don't have a human spirit. See, when, you get, when you're born again, that's when you get a human spirit. Okay? That human spirit, not Holy Spirit, human spirit, this is the born, if I can spell it, born again. That's what you get. When you are born, you have a soul, okay? you have a body, but guess what you don't have? Spirit. Human spirit. Okay? When Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were created with a human spirit. And when the Lord said, even this day you will die, that died. How long did they live? 900 years plus. So either the Lord lied, or they lost something there. And they did. When they lost this, they had, the, they had no ability to talk to the Lord anymore. Okay? And this is what happens with us, is that until you're saved, this is the part, if you look at... I think it's 2 Thessalonians 5. Um, I think it's 5. It talks, it's one of the very few places that says, talks about your soul, uh, talks about your spirit, your human spirit, and talks about your body. Talks about all three of them. You don't see it. Many times these two are put together. And if you know why, it's that piece in Hebrews that says, dividing even the soul and the spirit. Why is it you have to divide the whole, whole the, the soul and the spirit? It's because in reality, they are so um, joined that they look like they're one when you become saved. Okay. Whatever it is, you take it with you when you die. This part never leaves. This part, I don't know about you, but mine's starting to get a little rubbish type. You know, it's kind of a little frayed here. So I'm perfectly willing to give it up. Didn't feel that way at 30. But today's a different story. Turned 68 yesterday and I thought, you know something? Ooh, awesome. That's a Sixty-eight is a really big number. <laughs> That's a freak out. Uh, even when I hear myself say it, I go, sixty-eight, you should be dead. <laughs> okay, so, that's really so you get the point of it. In reality, um, that's what's going on. So this is the part that's born again. This is the part that allows us to communicate and talk to God. This is the part when the Holy Spirit teaches, He teaches our spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches our spirit. And this is the part that talks to the soul. And these two together allow us to keep in the mentality of our soul, Bible doctrine. If you do not have this, like 2 Corinthians 2, you don't understand anything God has to say. Okay? And when you evangelize somebody and you give them the Word of God, they still don't understand it. So the Holy Spirit has to act with them to talk to their soul, just like ours normally works, so they understand that truth. That's a good thing because when we mess up the evangelistic message, the Holy Spirit gets it right. And He makes sure that their soul completely understands it. That's why they're accountable for it. That was a lot of stuff. But anyway, so let's move on. The enemy is the cross. So, do not live your Christian life emotionally. Okay? If you do, you will be happy, but God will disqualify you. Okay? And your spouse will do that. Yeah, yeah. What happens, what happens with, with emotions is that when I get all emotional, everybody else gets emotional. And we're all just getting crazy. It's like, okay, we all feel really great because now we have endorphins and all that stuff. <laughs> but have we done one thing for God? No, other than embarrassed Him. That's what we've done. We've embarrassed Him. Okay? When Christians act like idiots, they embarrass Christ. They, they embarrass the name of the Lord. Okay? When you run into somebody who is stable and sober, and clear. Everybody wants to be around that person. Okay? I mean, I, th there's, there's people I have in my life who really like being with me. I don't quite get it because I know I'm a squirrel, okay? But what they're attracted to is God in me. And, and that's how I, when I became saved, the guy who I knew had the answer, who knew he had Christ in him, was an absolute idiot. He still is kind of an idiot. But what he had was something that my soul could see, but my eyes couldn't. So I remember calling him and saying, I'm going to church with you. And he goes, what? Yeah, I'm going to go to church with you. When are you going? What time do I have to be there? He said, I want to get into a Bible study. And he's going, 
who is this? You know, who is this, Richard? But in reality, that's what happened. My soul saw that thing, and I could see it, and I, I wanted it. I wanted that stability. I wanted that clarity. Okay, and that's what a lot of times people want to be with Christians because of that very reason. Is because they feel that stable. The world's unstable, but Christians are not supposed to be. Okay. Um, Matthew twenty six seventy five. We better get moving. I don't want to spend the whole life on this thing. <laughs> But this is good stuff because it helps you, it helps you see real life stuff and make comparisons. Twenty six seventy five. Um, Fifty. That's a lot of verses in twenty six seventy five. You all know this story, so we're not even going to read it. It says Peter remembered the words of Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And Peter and Peter went outside and wept bitterly. Remember Peter? There's me Roman, I will die for you, Lord! Now, guess, what, guess what side that was? That was this side. Robert met the road, and all of a sudden Peter's going, huh? Remember? Who chased him off? The little girl. I saw you with him! No, no, it wasn't me! He started cursing at her, that guy, yeah. So, <coughs> so is this weeping appropriately? No. Peter should have sat there and said, I know I'm an idiot. Okay, so what do I do? That's what he should have done. But what happened, he was so overwhelmed by his own betrayal of Christ, he couldn't orient himself. He was overwhelmed. What he did, he ran away like a little baby. He should have sat there and said, you're right, I'm an idiot. Confess that sin, remember what God told him to be, and then he could have sat there and said, well, you know something, I'm going to watch this trial with John. Because John was there. John's the one who wrote about it, right? He was the one who was inside with the high priest, because he knew them. So, we know that Peter, we understand that. We have all betrayed the Lord and had this feeling. Okay? This is when you do something and then doctrine pops up in your head and you go. Usually, I'll tell you what, ah, crap. <laughs> yeah. What am I going to do with me, right? Yeah, this, is when you, this is when you wonder why the Lord saved you. And he says, it's grace. Remember, Richard's grace. You go, oh, I don't remember now. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. So, that's Peter there. This one is a great one. Um, Second Samuel. I probably should read the other ones. Let's read the other ones. We probably get through it faster. Let's go, let's go through. Let's go through this one. John 11. No, no, no. no. Let's go, since we're at Matthew, let's go this one. It's good at Matthew. Okay, I know we have. I'm getting most up here. Uh, let's go do 2337. And that's this one right here. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Yeah. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This is Jesus speaking. So if it's Jesus speaking, we already know that this is appropriate, huh? We don't have to do anything with it, right? This, there is no assessing this other than whatever his reaction is, it's right. Because Jesus never sinned, ever. Not even, not even mentally. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who have killed the prophets and stoned those uh, to you, how often I have longed to gather your children um, together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Um, and then this is followed by, this is actually the same, very similar, the one in Luke uh, 19. Let's go, let's go to Luke 19. <clears throat> it's a couple chapters over to the right. And we'll hear some of the other pieces. This is actually more than one viewpoint of this. 19, Luke 19, 1941. Uh, 1941. Uh, as he approached, now this is the part, that, this, is, this is a parallel piece, but Luke adds something to this, okay? He says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known this day uh, what, uh, what would bring you peace, but it, but it is now hidden from your eyes. Mm -hmm. How far are we going to that? Okay. Mm -hmm. 244. Okay. <clears throat> hidden from your eyes. They will dash you to the ground, and you and your children within your walls. Um, they will not leave you one stone on the other, uh, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is a rebuke. So you see, this is part of the same one. This, this verse here is too. This is actually 
the same viewpoint as this one, but we know from this one that Jesus wept over this, okay? We know that he wept. Um, and what he weep about, he wept that, you know something? Um, I'll, t I'll tell you, the, the answer to this question is that what is he talking about here? This is the, um, in, in 40 years from this time, he speaks this in 30 AD. 40 years later is 70 AD, 40 years, 70 AD. <clears throat> this is when General Titus comes in and conquers Jerusalem. He takes down the temple, he takes down there so there's not one stone even on top of the other. One million people, Israelites, die. In that, in that, they are they are prisoners of that for two years. Josephus writes about it called uh, for two years. They are prisoners. They eat each other's babies. They murder each other. They are cannibalistic. Okay, they are starving to death. One of the most horrible things you will ever read is if you read Josephus, it will be the account of what he is talking about. <clears throat> and that's why he's saying is that. God sent Jesus Christ to show up as your Messiah, and you rejected him. And as a consequence of that rejection, you have rejected God and his protection. And therefore, I will move, Christi I will move Judaism into Christianity. And we know that's true because after 30 AD, <coughs> okay, and he talks this, shortly after this, he goes to the cross, 40 days after the resurrection, days. He goes up, 10 more days go by. This is the ascension. 10 more days we have Pentecost. That's why it's called Penta, 50 days, okay? From the, from the first verse. <clears throat> 50 days later. And this is when the church comes into being, okay? That's what he's talking about. So if you know your history, you just back yourself right up and you can tell exactly what he's talking about. But, he, but he's telling me, he says, you know something? I, I weep over you. I know this is, this is the consequence of your rejection of God. You do not know it, but 40 years, I'm going to give you 40 years for you to come to the church. And this is, when, this is, the, this is the time when you have the Pentecost, you have all that stuff happening right, at, right after it. It's not a short time. These are days. After the, he says that, it's days after that happens. He has warned them. He, he grieves in his soul because he does not want that to happen. But they have rejected him and they have brought that on themselves. Okay. <clears throat> this, is, this is the equivalent, in my mind, is that it sounds tough, but it would be like me saying, you know something, I don't care about the rules around here, and me running down the freeway with my eyes closed. Okay? Now, if I make such a stupid decision, the chances of me dying are very, very high. Okay? It's not the traffic, it's not the freeways, it's not the bad driving, it's one moron running down with his eyes closed. Okay? <clears throat> this is what we have here. When you reject the Lord, that's what you do. You're the same as the per Rejecting authority, when you reject the authority of God, it is like a person who has no rules, has no principles. That makes sense? You live a life of no principles. What happens, you sit there and say, you know, I, I, I can do this. I don't have to obey these laws. But they have consequences to that. And that's what happens here. Okay. Oh, five more minutes. Okay. So, oh, this is one of the more, yeah, John 11, since we're there, just the next chapter, John 11, 35. This is one of the more interesting ones, completely debatable. Uh, we know the answer, we just don't know the why. Okay. It's emotional. It is emotional. That's right. But we, but do we know that this emotion is appropriate? We do because who did it? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus did it. It's appropriate. We we may not know why. In fact, nobody knows why Jesus wept. There's lots of people who talk about. It. Well, he wept because his friend, you know, died. It's like, well, wait a minute. Um, the only problem with that is that in this verse here, he brings him back to life. Okay, That's so why did he die? Emotion so, is perfect. Perfect emotion. It's perfect emotion. Yes, 35 says Jesus wept. And 43 says, he knows, what, he knows what's going to happen. Okay? Um, he says, and what he said in a loud voice, Jesus, uh, Lazarus, come forth. He, he, he knows he's going to, so why is he weeping? What is this about? Nobody, and I'm not going to try to give you the answer because there is no answer to it that we know of. But some of the answers I think that you look at is that he looks at and sees that his friend Lazarus has gone through the pain of death. His sisters have wept for three days. 
because of that. And that, the epitome of that is the impact of sin on the world. When the first sin came into the world, what was the impact of that? It has been grieving and horrible things since that day. It was not meant to be that way. And the person who knows that is Jesus himself. It was never, death was never meant to happen. Okay, that's why it's thrown at the end of the, and when we get to, when we get to chapter 20, we'll see it gets, it gets thrown into the lake of fire. Okay. So it was not supposed to be there. I think what Jesus is seeing from his human part is the impact, and, and not the old sin nature because he didn't have one, but from his human emotions, he's weeping because he sees that impact that sin has caused. Okay. Um, but that one's a very debatable one. We just know it's right because Jesus says it does it, and we know that he is sinless. This is an interesting one here, uh, Samuel 19, 2 Samuel 19. And uh, hopefully we can get through this before we, uh, worst case I can give you the answer, sir. Right? Um, yeah, this is Absalom. This is also, and, and you can read this and, and see, what the, see what it means here. Um, uh, Joab was told, uh, this is after um, Absalom died, okay? Um, and if you remember, if you remember, if you've read this story, you know some of the things Absalom did. Mm -hmm. Absalom was David's favorite son. He loved him. It was his first son. He absolutely loved him. And they were deeply tied to the point that even when uh, the, one of the biggest problems David had is he couldn't raise a hand to him. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't uh, discipline him. And sadly, Absalom couldn't discipline himself. Okay, and that's what causes all the grief. If you remember, he came in, took him over as king, slept with all of his wives, did just all these horrible, horrible things, and he certainly deserved death. But this is what happens: is that when he dies, David is just overwhelmed. Says Joab was told the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. He's not weeping; he's just he's just weeping and weeping and weeping. Absalom, Absalom, oh my Absalom! He's just he's just over overwhelmed. Uh, it says and uh, and for the whole army. Um, the victory um, that day was turned into mourning. What happened is that they had beaten Absalom and his army and had taken back the kingdom and restored it to David where it was supposed to be. Okay? But what's happening here is that because of the way that D David is acting, the army is now feeling that they did something wrong, that they shouldn't have. And this is what jo Joab, this Joab's like the angel. He's the guy who says, wait a minute, stupid, what are you doing here? Okay? And it's really important to have somebody that in your life. It's important to have somebody in your life who will, 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 when you're doing something stupid, will front you with that, make you mad with it, but will not back down because it's important that you know. And you'll be angry with them, and they have to be able to take your anger. Okay? That's critical. If you can't do that, you're worth nothing to your friends. Okay? You might want to be diplomatic, but this is pretty good. Um, because on that day, the troops heard it said... The king is grieving for his son. The men stole into the city that day as men steal into a city who are ashamed. I mean, they, didn't, they should have come in triumphal. They're coming in almost, yeah, yeah, almost, almost really uh, shameful um, when they flee from battle. The king, covered his the king covered his face and cried out loud, Oh, my son, Absalom, oh, my son, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. Okay. And Joab went into the house of the king and said, Today you have humiliated all of your men. I love Joab. Yeah, he does some goofy stuff, but he, he loves David. Okay? And he's confronting him here. He says, Who have just saved your life, the life of your sons and your daughters and your wives and your concubines. We saved you. And this is the way you treat us. That's really what he's saying here. He says, You love those who hate you, and you hate those who love you. That's emotion. When you do that, that's the stuff up here. That's the stuff we're seeing that where your, your emotions are overrunning your mentality because David knows better. Remember? Man after God's own heart. Remember that? Okay, this is one of his goofy things. You have made it clear today that the, uh, that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. I see that you would be pleased if Absalom were alive and today all of us were dead. Wow. I love this guy, you know, because when you get stuck, and everybody gets stuck, it, it, it's, it's a joke I always talk about, it's okay to be stupid, don't stay stupid. Okay? We all, we're all human beings, we have that side to us. And this is what happens, you have to have a friend, somebody who knows Bible doctrine, 
who, when you're doing something weird, stops you in your tracks and says, don't do it. And this is why. And they may hate you, and they may anger you, they may shut you off their list, mm -hmm. but you are doing God's work when you confront them. Okay? So that's it for this verse. Notice the differences so that you know when your emotions are appropriate. So that when you know. If a person has died and gone to heaven, you can sit there and say, I'm going to really miss them, but I'm so happy for them. They've graduated. They are, I hate to say it, they're 10,000, they're, they're actually infinite. They're 10,000 times better than I am today. That's wonderful. That's true. So it is, it is when you have your emotions, and your emotions should be able to sit side by side with Bible doctrine. That's called control. So let's pray. We'll go to the next verse next week. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your great love for us. Thank for you that you give us so many examples of the appropriateness of emotions and feelings, even when they're grieving and weeping. We pray, Lord, that we will remember this lesson that in the future we will all run into this because we're human beings, that we will stop and reorient ourselves with the truth from your word. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Emotion, emotion, emotion. emotion. <laughs> if you're going to have emotions, do them like Jesus does, right? Thank you, Lord. If you don't tell people the truth in Bible doctrine, you're not their friend, just to let you know. I'm going to go after the babies. Where's Mrs. Fenimore go? My wife abandoned me. I don't, I don't, think, know. She, she I think, she, I don't think she likes this class anymore. Isn't this still there? Happy birthday to you. Oh, happy birthday to you. No emotion. Happy birthday to you. Same territory, you know. And then I'm Thank you, thank you. Very, very sweet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're just numbers. We've been there 10,000 years. We're going to talk about it. Yeah. I've been here 10,000 years today. <laughs> Um, hi, Ia. I don't know if she's here. Bye, Ia. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, uh, you, you're so welcome. No, she's, I think she said happy birthday. Oh, happy, well, happy birthday. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to call you this week. I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you at? Well, I... As soon as you leave, Joseph. I know. I said, I don't have to leave. I don't have to leave. Yeah, I'm going to No, no, no. He was sitting out there. Probably because you left. He goes, but you left. I'll be back in a minute. I'm going to take the keys and then I'm going to check in and see if it's okay. okay. Oh, you know, they were taking pictures of them by Chanel and Louis Vuitton. Uh -huh. no I'm like, <laughs> I'm so different from my first Yeah. <laughs> I'm just so different. Wow, we. I'm going to give these to Marcy and Orly. Who else do you have? Was John here? John?